and the Metropolitan Council, which includes St. Paul, uh, the section of our city that's west of 35E, so quite a bit of the uh, Central Corridor or Green Line uh, alignment and its, uh, its, uh, its adjacent neighborhoods. So thanks again for, for coming and making time this morning to uh, share your thoughts about the supplemental uh, uh, economic or environmental impact statement on the, the project. Uh, I'd like to uh, just note that this is the first of two hearings to, to be held today. The second is at uh, 6 o'clock this evening, and that will be held at which location? Goodwill Easter Seals. At Goodwill Easter Seals at 6 o'clock. So uh, if you uh, see friends and colleagues uh, and, and family members who may be interested in participating in this process but weren't able to make it this morning, please uh, invite and encourage them to attend this evening. Uh, we've got uh, a number of folks that uh, I'd like to acknowledge. Um, our chair, Susan Hagg, is intending to attend this morning, uh, and uh, she'll be here shortly, I believe. Sandy Rummel, a uh, fellow council member, is also uh, with us this morning. And then we have uh, some senior staff, Mark Furman and Catherine O'Brien, also from our, uh, from our team, who will be uh, presenting on the... Uh, on the supplemental work uh, this morning and then meeting, uh, excuse me, introducing the, the basis for uh, this morning's hearing. So again, thank you very much for, for being here. Mark. Thank you very much, Councilmember Cummers. Again, I'm Mark Furman. I'm the Program Director for New Start's Rail Projects here in the Twin Cities. And uh, I'm going to make a couple more introductions here before we get into the uh, formal public hearing. Uh, just arriving and hanging his coat, Councilmember Adam Denick. Uh, welcome, Councilmember. And also, St. Paul Councilmember Russ Stark has joined us, so uh, thank you very much for stopping in this morning, Russ. Uh, this morning, I will uh, take a couple minutes just to walk us through really the ground rules of today's public hearing. Uh, you all have seen the document online and uh, taken a look at it, so we look forward to hearing your comments. So the, uh, the purpose for today's hearing is really to listen, uh, to listen to your comments uh, based on the supplemental document that we published uh, back at the, uh, the end of December, and really uh, speak specifically. Good morning, Chair Hay. Hi. Hi. Uh, we'll let you get settled. If that's okay, okay I'll just walk through the ground rules. Okay. Uh, and the focus of the hearing is uh, really quite narrow, and that is related to the construction-related potential impacts on uh, your business revenues as you operate your businesses here along the uh, Central Corridor. Uh, the document was published in uh, December, December 14th, for a period of 45 days. So we're in the midst of that comment period now, and uh, that'll continue till uh, the end of January. Uh, January, 30th. Jan January 30th uh, will be the concluding day for uh, receipt of public comment. These comments will be incorporated into the overall uh, environmental documentation for the project, and the responses, your comments and the responses to those uh, will ultimately appear in the uh, final environmental impact statement. That will come later this spring. Uh, no, uh, no news here, a familiar map of the alignment and the stations that we are speaking to here today. Uh, we are not here today to talk about Southwest LRT or any other LRT. Our focus is on the Central Corridor Green Line. Where we're at on the project, uh, as you all live in the corridor and have experienced the construction the last two years, uh, we're pleased to say that uh, the overall project now is 87% complete. The civil works for uh, this end of the project here, what we call the Civil East St. Paul side of the uh, civil construction, is 99% uh, complete. So all the roadways, the 
sidewalks and the 14 stations on the St. Paul end of the project are complete. Now that's not the end of construction. You can see on the chart here that systems construction has begun, but that will be the focus of construction in 2013. That means there will be uh, crews still, construction crews still working, but they'll be primarily out along the uh, railroad tracks, along the guideway as we say, and they'll be erecting poles and all the electrical wiring to provide the power to the trains uh, once they start operating. Towards the end of 2013, uh, you'll begin to see more regularly some, uh, some of our new light rail vehicles that have begun to arrive and be delivered to Minneapolis. And they will begin doing some testing along the alignment uh, to check on the power and the train signals and traffic signals and communication links back to the rail control center. So uh, you'll continue to see a fair amount of activity in 2013, and that will include light rail vehicles here as we uh, move into the fall of this year. And then we're still on schedule open up uh, sometime in the middle of next year. We can say now next year. <laughs> Council members, which is uh, nice to say now this week. So uh, for the ground rules today, uh, we would certainly invite you and encourage you to sign at the table there. Uh, Shu and Nakongo are accepting any uh, folks who want to sign up and uh, testify, get in the queue. Uh, at the end, after we exhaust that sign up list, uh, we will certainly still welcome folks to uh, ask to speak from the floor, uh, but you will be after all those who have signed up in advance. So we'll call your name, uh, and once you come to the microphone, we'll ask you to state your name and address. Uh, if you represent an agency or organization, we would want to know that as well. If you're speaking as an individual uh, or an individual business, we'd ask that your comments be about three minutes in length. If you're representing a more community-based organization, uh, we would ask for up to five minutes worth of comments. Uh, and again, just emphasize that this is a public hearing to talk about the Central Corridor, Green Line, as to talk about those business impacts uh, caused by construction. Uh, in addition to your verbal comments, uh, we'd love to hear those today, but if you have uh, other comments or if you'd like to submit your oral testimony in uh, formal writing, uh, you can do so, and those will be submitted either uh, via email to the email address you see here, or to Catherine O'Brien, uh, our lead environmental uh, expert on the project, and that's her address <coughs> if you want to send it via USPS. Comments uh, are open until January 30th. So uh, with that, Madam Chair and Council Members, I'll pass it back to you, and perhaps we can get started. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for uh, providing that interview. I want to introduce John Thomas, who is our council member who represents uh, this part of the Central Quarter, and Council Member Rummel, who is Tripp's brother to Mark, and, and as a county analysis, saw Council Member Adam Gunnick in the back, who is a, um, uh, represents the uh, uh, Minneapolis uh, portion of the uh, Central Quarter. Uh, I'm Sue Hay, I'm the chair of the Met Council, and I appreciate all of you coming out this morning. Uh, we also have another uh, public hearing uh, scheduled this evening at 6 p.m. Is that correct, Mark? And that is at um, a, no, Goodwill. Goodwill. Um, so uh, if you have uh, colleagues or um, um, uh, businesses or neighbors that would uh, like to speak and didn't get the chance to get here this morning, uh, they can come this evening as well. Uh, and with that, uh, I appreciate all of you coming, and I look forward to hearing the testimony. Uh, there's the list, Madam Chair. Oh, just going to begin calling up folks from the list. Uh, first is uh, Vaughn Larry. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ward 1. My neck of the woods. Um, we've been involved. I'm from Aurora St. Anthony Neighborhood Development Corporation, and I, I represent the folks back there in Aurora St. Anthony Neighborhood. I, I, I can't. I can't hear. Sorry about that. I represent. I'm from Aurora St. Anthony Neighborhood Development Corporation. 
uh, which is at 774 University Avenue. Uh, we've watched this uh, project with anticipation. Myself, I've been working on this since 205. So, uh, that being said, uh, we've seen a lot of stuff happening down at this end. We saw a lot of businesses that really were trying to hang on at the time. They couldn't. Um, but we have fought for, for this thing, and there are some reports that weren't done right. Um, we're still here, but we, we'd like to get equity for our people down in this area. Um, that report that, that had to be redone shouldn't have had to be redone. So that being said, welcome. Uh, please listen to what we have to say down here. Um, the businesses down here are really struggling. Uh, there was a combination, I guess it would be your perfect storm, uh, a, a long uh, construction uh, period plus uh, a media, media that didn't understand that we did need people to come down here and visit our businesses. So, so bringing those people back to this area is going to be a hard thing to do. So that's what we want is we want people to come back and, and visit our area, spend their dollars here, and, and make sure that, that we're surviving down to here. Thank you. Thank you. Next, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Mike Sipko. Good morning, my name is Mike Zipko and I am the uh, board chair of the Midway Chamber of Commerce and uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, allow us to come here and share some of our thoughts. Uh, the Midway Chamber has been strongly involved with advocating and trying to support the business interests along the Central Corridor and we will continue to do so. Uh, we urge you to continue the work to better understand and fully understand the impact this project has had on businesses to try and find more objective ways to measure the impact so it helps people understand both what happened and a little bit more about why and maybe to be able to predict this in the future. Uh, we think it's important to do as you move forward, take practical steps as you're looking at ways to support businesses that are, have meaningful impacts, but understand that you don't have enough resources to solve every problem, make the most significant, most practical investments. Uh, we think the focus needs to be uh, to continue to be on business mitigation and business support long after the train is running in 2014. Uh, what, one of the things we've found is that even after construction had been finished on the western part of the, the of University Avenue, uh, Tra traffic had not come back. People had perceived that the entire avenue and the entire area was on was a, a uh, not accessible place. And I think the message needs to, uh, the focus needs to continue until the trains are running, and even long after that. Uh, we also hope that the lessons that have been learned from uh, the business impacts and some of the <coughs> successful and less than successful mitigation efforts can be documented, shared, and be used to uh, shape future projects to make the, what happens in this metro area better going forward. Uh, the business community understands transit investments need to continue in this marketplace. We're hoping that this, uh, the painful lessons that have been learned here can help inform other projects and make us a smarter uh, region as we do move forward. Uh, the Midway Chamber wants to continue to be a resource uh, and an advocate for the business community and, and willing to engage with the um, Met Council and other advocates here continuing to go forward. It's been our history, it's our legacy, and we're going to continue to do this long after the train is running and want to continue to be an advocate for both the businesses and uh, with the impact that transit has had. We also like to uh, applaud and uh, congratulate the effort that the Met Council has undertaken with Mod and Company for the recent marketing materials the book and some of the other ways to help brand and help people identify different parts of the avenue we think are great. Uh, we think they are easy for people outside the area to understand. We think it's very, um, probably one of the most dramatic uh, marketing efforts we've seen in a long time. We're doing what we can to share it and we encourage you to continue activities like that. And we just you know, hope that this process, as painful as it's been, like we said, creates lessons and good, uh, good steps to be taken going forward because we strongly support the Central Corridor but also are very concerned about the impact it's had on our members and everything from what we try to do with lunch on the avenue to other things that we're trying to do. Our efforts aren't going to continue and we just want to continue to advocate on behalf of the businesses along the corridor. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Jack McCann. <coughs> Good morning. Um, my name is Jack McCann. I am the president of the University Avenue Business Association, representing uh, approximately 240 members uh, up and down the University Avenue corridor. 
The uh, comments I'm going to make are based on the report itself. <coughs> Uh, starting with, uh, in the report, uh, I am disagreeing with the uh, portion on the alternatives covered more than once, uh, stating the different alternatives that were uh, looked at and uh, deciding finally on one called the preferred method. Uh, it refers to a 2009 record of decision in 2010 and then in 2011 finding of no significant impact study. Uh, those reports, I believe, came after the preferred method was already chosen, so the latter two uh, have already been determined uh, as bogus reports. They really didn't uh, address things uh, in the manner, and that is probably why we are back here again today. Uh, the real uh, experts on the avenue, the business owners, made it clear time and time again there would be a lot of damage. It started in 06. I've been the president since 2009. Uh, I've heard at least a thousand stories on this. Uh, had a proper evaluation been done, the preferred method would not probably have been approved by the FTA for the matching funds of $450 million due to failing the cost-effective index. Uh, it even did not include three extra stations which were added later. There's a huge amount of funding that was left out of the funding request by not admitting the damage was significant. The preferred method uh, is believed to that simply what the Met Council desired and wanted to fit the scheme of the transit in the area, and uh, it appears that the studies were massaged to support that. Uh, next, the study does not go on to state any real amount of damage in dollars. Real dollar amounts would have been, had to have been included in the request for funding in the form of mediation or mitigation. Left out, of the pic left out of the picture is the damage to the residents and the home values. There is a direct relationship between small business and the nearby residents. Left out is the economic downturn from the planning stage prior to construction. Businesses were leaving and there wasn't a proper study leading up to the construction. Businesses got out of the way of the train. Had, uh, it, it had an effect on the vacancy that uh, we are currently reporting is 25% or, or thereabouts. It also has a very big direct uh, impact on the comment in the report saying that a net loss of three businesses over the course of construction. It's kind of a joke. You don't end up with 25% vacancy by losing three businesses. Uh, the typical corridor, similar to this all throughout the country, rates about 9% vacancy. So uh, it was not properly uh, examined. Uh, Left out of the report is also rental property. Uh, it happens to be my business. My business is uh, rental offices and warehouses. Uh, there was, uh, we saw an enormous downturn. Some of it, I will admit, was due to the general economic uh, situation in the, in the city. But, personally, during the two years of construction and leading up to it, I was told numerous times by um, Realtors and and uh, possible tenants that they just simply don't want to be down here during the construction phases or until things are up and running, which is still 2014, so another year plus away. Uh, based on that, uh, the dollar amounts uh, I've seen in my business, two to three dollars per foot rent. I've got about 200,000 square feet in the area down there. Uh, the simple math is 400 to 600 thousand dollars annually. That is a very slow recovery when you have a 25% vacancy rate. The, uh, the economics of it is people can rent cheaper elsewhere when there's vacant properties. So the recovery of the per square foot is very slow to come around. And uh, third, in the future uh, business section in the report, uh, it's kind of funny. The project did not listen to the so-called experts, the businesses up and down the avenue for years leading up to the project. But now the businesses say they expect uh, an increase and to see an uptick, and it's reported happily. This avenue is at its worst financially. Where else are we supposed to go but up? It's kind of obvious. This project, from planning to design to funding to construction, can be summed up as dishonest and pathetic. We shouldn't have been here in the first place if an honest organization, which is not the Met Council, would have openly evaluated the real effects of shoehorning a project this size onto this avenue. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is um, Brenda, is it Tyke? From um, United Medical.
Thank you. United Medical is at University and Western. Um, we are an MRI center, which the report reflects that medical companies did not lose any income. We lost over 30% of our income during the construction. We had to accommodate with long hours, overtime, doing to some of the things that were happening with the equipment out on the streets, including early morning, late nights, and Saturdays and Sundays to accommodate some of the stuff when we didn't know about when it was happening. We additionally had to do extra repairs on our equipment, which was the total of that was roughly $20,000 to $30,000. Our patients had a hard time getting around to finding the locations because the streets were closing, but that was with everybody's case, so that wasn't strictly to us. And then some of the patients are still continuing to complain about parking. I mean, I know there's some on the university, but it's still limited. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next up is um, from my uh, spine uh, center, and it's, is it Dot Davis? Hello, good morning. My name is Davis. I represent my spine center, and I just have a few uh, Thoughts here. Um, over um, our revenue, we lost about 30 percent, about 60 to 30 to 60 thousand, and we have uh, lots of trouble of our patient finding parking space during the constructions. Uh, due to the constructions, patient don't want to come to treatment for our chiropractic clinic because uh, it's it's a big hassle. And I just want to uh, share this with you. Thank you. Um, next up is um, it looks like Troy DeCourcy. Uh, Troy DeCourcy. I own uh, the Love Doctor in St. Paul, Minnesota here on uh, University and Snelling. Um, regarding uh, the loss of business, uh, we definitely have felt it by about 40% um, per month just in lost revenue. The uh, thing I do not see in this, and this is one of my biggest things, is that we do not see the Midway Coalition helping any of the small businesses here, especially with what I'm going through right now with signage. Um, we wanted to have a new sign put up to so that traffic could see us coming back and forth and see our name. We were actually going with a smaller sign than what we had. We were approved by the zoning department, had to wait the 10 days for appeal, and of course the 10 days were up and someone appealed it, which was the New Way Coalition and Russ Stark. These are two people that, you know, well, the group and then Russ Stark, these are people that we count on, you know, to help us out during this process to get our business to survive during this construction. And they are arguing the fact that I'm asking for a smaller sign and more visibility. Um, and I think it's wrong, but we have lost a lot of money due to no parking. Um, we do have a lot that's in the back of our building that the city is trying to work on, but has, you know, this was supposed to be done a long time ago. I guess the, the facts are is that we don't, as business owners, are not getting the help that we deserve. Um, regardless whether you like us or not, whether what it is, it's everybody is feeling this and we're, you know, we need help. And there's money left over for this parking uh, deal that's, there's a lot of money left over that's not being used for the parking for our businesses. That seems to be going away. But according to our contracts that we have with you guys, the $20,000 that we got, in that it shows an amount for parking. If you're not going to use that, then give it to the businesses that could use this money to stay alive. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, next up is Clay Lambert. Madam Chair, Council Members, Directors, um, I own uh, Metro Petro. It's on 2700 University Avenue Southeast over in Prospect Park. Um, I, uh, I own a gas station. It seems to be in conflict with the light rail, but I actually uh, testified a few years ago that I would like it um, because uh, I, there's just no way I'm ever going to be able to pay an affordable living wage as for a cashier or a college kid. That's not my job. Um, we give them a job. We, we teach them how to work, how to show up to work every day. But they're still broke, and they still need a ride to work. And that's what the light rail will do for me, is bring employees, bring uh, customers, and all that stuff. So it still works for me. I have, um, I named a portion of the light rail system. Um, it's called, a, I call it the patch. It's between Prospect Park and the stadium. It's, we're in the patch. 
And um, what happened was uh, the first year, no impact. I was really surprised. We had a great year, so banks said fine, great, no problem. The second year, it was it was bad. We went right off the cliff, went straight down. Um, that was university, and then I think around July, uh, Huron and University in Washington just looked like a bomb went off, and it went even deeper. <coughs> um, I applied for the loan and um, was denied. Everything was uh, given, or I achieved all my uh, eligibility requirements except for the $2 million uh, gross sales limit because I sell gas. Um, gross more, or cost of goods on gas is super high, and so um, it's, I'm, of course, I'm gonna go way over on that. What uh, I'd like to do and what I've kind of found out, there's really no formal appeal process uh, other than just coming here or writing a letter back to the, uh, I think it's St. Paul Housing Authority. Um, that's where we're at right now. Um, but one thing I would like you to consider is uh, if you stretch all those businesses out, which you guys are very familiar with who's who now by now, we believe that of the folks that are uh, in the, above the $2 million range along the whole section, I, I'm pretty sure I'm in the 10% or maybe even 5% of that range. Then of those, more people fall out of there like Holiday Gas Station, Target, da da da, because they own multiple locations. So when you really feather it back down, I'd say I'm in a 1% or less than 1%. And then from there, I just like a, a hearing or a, an opportunity to appeal it to, because Prospect Park is really uh, has a large portion of the funding left. And the 20,000, I'll let one, it's a nice, I would, I would accept it gladly. So um, something to consider in this uh, piece of uh, uh, hearing here um, for people. Sorry, a little self-serving, but maybe there's someone else out there in my predicament. Thank you very much. Thanks for Thank the opportunity. You. Thank you. Um, uh, there's no one else on my list, but uh, perhaps some are signed up. Thank you. Next is uh, Mike Lattis and then Pete Lattis. I'm Mike Lattiff, I own Lattiff Brothers. I'm and sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Mike Lattiff from Lattiff Brothers. From what? Lattiff Brothers. I'm thinking the, the, the microphone. And uh, I'm actually going to speak on, uh, uh, my business partners will speak on our business, but I'm going to speak on a loss of a tenant that we have. Uh, we used to have Enterprise rent a car with us for about 18 years, and they were really good tenant of ours, they're a compliment to our business. And they wanted to stay, and they offered us a 15 year extension lease uh, at, at about $5,000 a month. And we had to turn them down because we didn't have a parking for them because we lost all our street parking. And we even tried to buy some lots, and the lots were so expensive to buy and develop that it, was, it wasn't feasible. But anyway, it was a huge loss to us have, for our business and also for having a tenant with income. Now we have an empty building. And this is all because of the parking we lost. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Peter Lattiff. I'm Pete Lattiff, uh, President of Lattiff Brothers Out of Body. Um, I just want to talk specifically about the effects that uh, light rail constructions had on our business. Our customer count in 2011 for estimates uh, was uh, 2,679 people showed up at our door for estimates. And this is, these numbers are from March until November in both circumstances, 2011, 2012. Uh, in 2012, we had uh, 2,200 people show up. That's a 17.6% drop in, in traffic to our door. If you look at it from a job count standpoint, how many people came to our door, and we wrote estimates for it, but weren't willing to come back to have the work done because of the problems with the traffic and, and everything else. Uh, we had uh, job count wise, it was 2272 uh, down to 1748. Uh, that's a 23.6% drop. Uh, 524 customers that we lost probably went somewhere else and had their cars fixed. We may never ever get them back. Uh, Without getting into you know numbers and everything, 
Sales were down 18.3%. Profit was down 52%. Um, it's a huge drop, not only for, for the business, but for our employees. They lost hours, they lost income. You know, it, it's, it's not just a business thing, it's the employee thing too. So you know, that's just what I want to make everybody aware of. And there should have been some kind of mitigation coming back you know, to help the businesses and help the employees. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't have anyone else uh, signed up on my list. If there is anyone else who would like to um, speak, uh, uh, just please come forward and give your name. Good morning. My name is Winston Wynn. I'm uh, the owner of uh, uh, 854 and 850 University Avenue, St. Paul. And I've been doing uh, No Republic for 22 years. And um, I run the restaurant cross street from here. It's in uh, the light rail uh, construction, my business way down maybe 60%. Um, I'm not again for light rail, but uh, I give a lot of uh, suggestion about how uh, light rail uh, construction and how they run and and the business on University Avenue still live alive and uh, we are very struggle with um, no parking we used to have a whole front parking but now we are none and um, the next door of our hall uh, was for sale, and I tried to pay it, uh, to buy it, and I pay uh, uh, application fee and everything, and I've been take care of that. Probably have been abandoned uh, vacation uh, for at least uh, six, seven years. But uh, the city of St. Paul, I heard that city of St. Paul bought it. And I'm really very really upset about why uh, I'm uh, the one, uh, the first, uh, have a priority to buy that property. But why St. Paul buy the little spot next to my door? And I talked uh, to uh, the city of St. Paul many times. I talked to uh, a development and city and uh, uh, city attorney and um, uh, my uh, lawyer at the city of St. Paul too, but nothing worked. And um, I don't want my business to die. Um, I, I want to keep it. So I, um, I give an idea that uh, many street and city, there are two land like we have here, uh, East 2 and West 2, so we can uh, give uh, business parking for uh, at least maybe from 9 to 5 they can park and one lane is, is uh, traffic moving and the land of fast on the uh, right will let the business parking or you know that will help a lot of the business and um, I don't know who have an auto ride for the probably at 846 and 848 that I have been uh, make a purchase agreement with the uh, realtor uh, for many years and I did several times but uh, uh, they uh, told me the city want that probably and uh, I want you have a authority to um, 
intervene with the city so I can buy that property. Uh, I can build it, uh, uh, at least a uh, half back out there parking on my rear uh, because I have uh, two lot is now uh, I'm going to uh, make a parking lot that uh, the city also uh, help to uh, to uh, build a parking lot and uh, so I, I I want to have the answer today that uh, uh, who know why the city want to buy the private my next door what the benefit they can buy many many probably uh, here like uh, Chevrolet, Mazda, uh, 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 many big uh, property they can, you know, do for city purpose. But uh, the little tiny 40 feet uh, wide, why they try, you know, they fight with me to buy that uh, or to keep that property. Yes, so Sorry, good. I can't answer that question uh, for you, but thank you for, for coming and sharing that information. Thank yeah, you. Okay. Uh, happy New Year. Yeah, thank you. Um, is there anyone else who uh, wanted to uh, speak this morning at the public hearing? Anyone else who would like to speak this morning? Hearing uh, no one else um, who has either signed up in writing or has uh, spoken uh, this morning, we're going to close the hearing for uh, this this morning. Uh, there will be a hearing again this evening at 6 p.m. Um, and thank you very much for your comments. Thank you for your patience during construction. Uh, and uh, uh, we will um, take this into consideration as we uh, review this material. So thank you very much.